Hey, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you a review of Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. Now, as with all my reviews, um, I have played this game more than 20 hours. In fact, Tainted Grail, I've spent roughly 54 hours playing, a little bit more than that. And that accounts for uh, 22 play sessions of Tainted Grail. Now, most of that, almost all of that, was solo play. I do have, I believe, one time I play with, with three people, including myself, so a three-player game. But again, this is going to be primarily a solo review, but I think since it's, being, since it's cooperative and I did have that one uh, experience with more players, I think this could pretty easily translate to uh, your, your experience with multiple players as well. Now, before we get down into Tainted Grill, I do want to mention our sponsor, Board Game Co. This is a great website where you can buy, sell, and trade games. They have a great selection of games for you to choose from. If you're just looking to build out your collection, buy more games, check out their stock. They've got something for everyone over there for sure. They also are willing to buy games from you. If you need to trim down your collection, sell your games to Board Game Co. They will take them off your hands. A very easy system to do that. And then, of course, they have a trade feature, which I think is really cool. It is uh, basically if you have a Board Game Geek account and you've set up a trade list over there, you then can go to Board Game Co., type in your Board Game Geek username. The website will automatically look at your Board Game Geek uh, trade list. They'll compare it with the Board Game Co. stock, what they've got in stock right now, and also what they're looking to get into stock. And then they'll build a custom trade list right there on their website to help facilitate the trade. Makes it very, very easy. I highly recommend it. Uh, be sure to click on the link in the description below so they know I sent you over there if you check them out. Board Game Co. makes it easy to buy, sell, and trade your way into a better collection. Now, the way we do our reviews is we give you five reasons you should buy the game and five reasons you shouldn't. And that actually, that style of review on this channel was originally done by Alex from Board Game Co. He has uh, eight or nine videos that he did on this channel using that style. So be sure to check those out and check out his YouTube channel, Board Game Co. as well. It's got a lot of great stuff going, over there, going on over there. Heavy, uh, heavy focus on Kickstarter but he does other stuff as well over there so be sure to check that out so let's see here we are going to start with five reasons you should buy tainted grill uh for and these are not in any particular order this is just kind of the five i just listed them out as i thought of them so i'm not ranking these reasons or anything like that so reason number one is the story in tainted grill which is almost entirely inside of this book this exploration journal the story is one of the best, most compelling stories that I have read for a board game. Uh, another one that comes close is probably the story in Madara, if anyone's familiar with that, uh, which Madara practically gives you a novel. So this isn't quite novel level as far as like the amount of text and everything, but it's really good writing. Again, we're not talking George R. R. Martin, we're not talking Game of Thrones here, but what we are talking is really solid, cohesive writing that makes sense and that draws you into the story. Um, it, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the theme, it's a dark take on the Arth Arthurian legend. They uh, have left the, you know, the original homeland and have gone to Avalon, which as it turns out, Avalon already had these creatures there called the Four Dwellers and, and Arthur, you know, and the original Knights of the Round Table beat them back a good ways into Avalon. And now the uh, regular humans have this foothold there, but are constantly kind of dealing with the fact that the Four Dwellers are still out there, still causing problems. And the, there's this stuff called the weirdness that uh, is constantly creeping out of the four dweller territory, trying to kind of reclaim the Avalon. And it's like this energy that just distorts everything, uh, kind of makes everything chaotic and not nonsensical. And, and you know, uh, buildings get smaller as you walk towards them. That, that sort of like just messes with reality. That's what the weirdness does. So these guys, the the Minhirs, these are statues that... Uh, 
apparently Arthur and the original knights and Merlin erected to dispel the weirdness and you have to keep them lit to keep the weirdness at bay and, and that's a big part of what the game is. So that gives you a brief idea of where you start with the story is all that stuff. Um, you're 600 years, I think 600 years later and now the weirdness is creeping back in. The men here are going out. Uh, the the heroes of the area of the world that you're in have have left to go try to deal with this problem, and they never returned. And so now you're like the B squad, the, the D squad, maybe. Uh, you're not actual heroes, and you have to go and see. Well, it's basically down to you, and you got to see what you can do and tr- and try to fix this situation. So that's the general setup for this this world. And then this exploration journal just builds that out even better. And then while you're playing, you have this, uh, this, this save sheet that you use to save the game. But on the back of it are these statuses. It's these, these, this, these checklists, basically. As you go through and as you do different things in the exploration journal, it might say, um, you know, check off or, or gain status Burning Mystery 1. And so you'll mark off Burning Mystery 1. And what that means is the game now will know for future stories, well, this has already happened because he has this status. So when you read this, it'll say, if you have Burning burning Mystery status 1 or Burning Mystery 1, then do this. If not, do this. And so you have this entire back page full of these statuses that you're checking off. And you can see just... I mean, I don't know how well you can see. Is this my original one? No, this is not a, a full game. I'm not sure where my original one is for the game I just completed. But you check off quite a few of these, but I didn't check off anywhere near all of them. So there's lots of things that I could have discovered that I didn't. And all of it with, I mean, there's a few exceptions. Anytime you're making this sort of uh, you know, choose your own adventure style branching story, you're probably going to run into a few things that maybe this story didn't quite line up just right. But those instances were so far and few between that it was really uh, compelling for me to keep pushing forward in, in the story because I loved seeing how all of this worked out, how all of this, uh, you know, developed and everything. Um, let's see. We, I'm trying basically I think that when you're getting into this game the story needs to be one of the main things that you're looking for in a game. If you're not the type of person that's going to enjoy a lot of reading that is narrative based, a lot you know this isn't reading rules, this is a, a narrative story that you're going through. If you're not going to enjoy that, you might want to steer clear, but if you are going to enjoy it, you're going to love what's inside of this book here. Um also, the, the end, I'm not going to spoil anything as far as the end goes, but I did feel like the end had a very satisfying conclusion that I really liked how it ended up. And I guess there possibly, I believe there are multiple endings. I enjoyed what what where I ended up, basically. The second thing why you might want to buy Tainted Grail is this is a very unique combat system. Uh, let's see, let me grab something here. So we've got this, uh, you know, pack of strays and you can go watch my uh playthroughs or my instructional video on how to play if you want to see uh, more clearly exactly how this works but on the card you have these keys up here that match up to attributes on your player board okay so for instance on this one this is a combat card so you're using this side of the player board and the attributes are aggression courage and practicality those are what are going to be used in combat with diplomacy, you have empathy, caution, and spirituality. So when you're doing a, a, a combat uh, encounter, you are going to then have your own cards that are going to come up next to it, and you're going to try to match up with the keys that are that you see here, and that will then allow you to deal damage and all this other stuff. And then when you're dealing damage, you don't necessarily always want to deal the most damage, unless you can deal enough to, to kill the creature, obviously. But sometimes, so for instance... If you deal uh, four damage to this pack of strays, you're not going to kill it, but they are going to run away. And if they run away, then you're not going to get the reward, which is one food. You don't get the food because they get out of there. You can't 
you know, butcher them up. So instead, you you want to hold back just enough. Maybe maybe you only deal one damage initially, and then uh, because you see that on your next go round, you might have a shot at dealing th- um, uh, f- four damage and taking it out because five health is is what you want to do. And so for five health is what they have, and that's, so you want to get to at least five to to finish them off. Um, and this is a level one creature here, and as you go through, there's it goes up to level four. I believe in the base game and there is more and more compelling and interesting choices of what's going to happen based off of the amount of damage you deal to, you know, creatures. Sometimes, you know, I'd find myself really trying to land in exactly the right spot because, you know, the, the second option down, you know, if, if they got dealt five damage, if that was how much they had, you know, we're trying to get to 10 and they got dealt five damage. Well, they're going to hit me back for three damage. But if they were at six, then they would not deal me any damage. Instead, maybe they would just heal themselves one. And then if I got them to seven, then they're dealing me four damage. And so there's like that sweet spot where you're trying to hit in there. You're trying to get to that exact point as almost like a breather. So then you don't take any damage and then you can get your cards for your next turn and throw down some more damage and try to get in the rest of the way to kill them. A lot of really interesting choices there as far as how you handle the combat, and then of course you're building your combat deck itself, which is a whole different level of choices. Uh, you know, as you level up and you have you gain, you know, more and more cards that you can add to your deck. You never, you're never going to get any close to using all of the cards available to you um, in the upgrade deck. You, you'll, because you draw two, uh, or you know, I believe you draw two, and then you pick one. And put it into your deck, right? And then, even then, you you can look at the cards that are that you have available to you at that point that you've acquired, and you, you might decide, you know what, I don't want to have all these in my deck. I'm going to take some of these out, put them over here, trim down the deck. That way, I am going to get to the good ones faster and and more frequently. But you don't want to keep you don't want your deck to get too small because then when you run out of cards in combat, if you haven't managed to kill, and this is everything I'm saying here, by the way, applies to diplomacy as well, uh, for the most part. If you run out of cards in combat or diplomacy, well, that's a problem too, and you're you're pretty much done at that point. So it's a real balancing act of keeping your deck nice and trim and making sure you can get to the cards you need to, but also having enough cards in there to be able to take the monster out or to be able to successfully navigate the diplomatic incident that you're dealing with. The one thing I'll say about diplomacy that's different is that you have this track that you're working. You're not you're not dealing damage. You're working up and down uh, this this track, and you know if it's going down, that means the other uh, the 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 encounter is you know winning the diplomacy, and if it's going up, then you're making your points well, and you're winning the diplomacy. And so that I felt like really captured kind of the the feeling of a conversation going back and forth and you know a war of words going back and forth you know and some sometimes you're you're dealing with uh fanatics you know and so there's certain routes you can take in the conversation that are that are better and sometimes you're dealing with uh you know local uh guards or whatever it's so many different options there a lot of cool stuff with the combat and diplomacy mechanism that I, I really haven't seen other places. Uh, number three, for reasons to buy Tainted Grail, uh, I felt the character progression is really compelling. Now, the, from the story perspective, absolutely also. There, there's, there's moments in here that only apply to individual characters. So you'll be playing and it'll say, if Maggot is, you know, interacting with this with this particular story event then this is a possibility and those are always cool when you find those but besides that as you uh progress through the different you know like i said you have these attributes here and these attributes on this side once you get uh two points in an attribute the third point is actually a skill card that goes on the side and the cool thing with these skill cards let me see where they go let's see yeah, here we go. So the cool thing with these skill cards is so on this side you have monster strength. This is for the aggression um, uh, attribute. You have monster strength on this side, right? And you have dual wielding on this side. Now each of these are going to give you something that you might consider useful, but they're on the same card, right? 
that's by design that you're gonna have to choose one. So dual wielding and monster strength can never be in the game at the same time because if you choose uh, monster strength, then you're going to slide that under the board and that means that dual wielding is now out of play because monster strength is being used. And once you assign it, it's pretty much there unless something happens where you end up losing some of your uh, um, attribute points. There's so many of these like individual cool choices as far as which side of the card to use, but then also so many cool options for aggression, so many cool options for empathy that really can help you know, make your character more able to deal with the, uh, the, the resource management in this game because there is a large resource management component to this game that I think catches a lot of people off guard. So having that character progression as you're building out your skills and, and you're trying to find skills that really uh, kind of match with what this character is all about. For instance, with Maggot, uh, he has his, so every every character has like a weakness, like a an impairment, and his is he's a recovering addict. When dreaming, he tosses a dial, and if it's a skull, then he gets the nightmare instead, whereas most people only get nightmares under very specific circumstances. Maggot gets them, just you know, 50% 50 of the time, Mag is going to have a nightmare. Well, you can, there are skills in here that can make nightmares be uh, somewhat beneficial. There are skills that uh, have all kinds of ways of mitigating the, the negative effects of nightmares. And, and in particular, like I said, there's some that can turn them almost into a benefit, which is pretty cool. Let's see, uh, number four. They only provided the minis that were absolutely necessary. Now you can buy more minis. You can So you have all these monsters, right? Some of these monsters, uh, let's see, are guardians such as, let's find a guardian here. The, the weird bear. The weird bear is a guardian, which means that it could end up out on the map, roaming around, possibly causing you a problem. If you just get the base game, you use the card, you put it on the map, right? There's the guardians, yeah, they play a role, but I mean, you don't need a mini for that because it's only gonna be out on the map a fraction of the time compared to everything else, right? Compared to having that entire an entire mini for that when the only time you would use it is when it's roaming the map as a guardian, you don't use it during combat. So if you want those minis, they gave you that option. You could you can get an expansion pack that has minis for all of the guardians, but they didn't make it something that just came with the game to take up space. They were able to figure out, okay, three miniers, the five heroes, and one four dweller. That's what we need for minis for because the you know the four dweller has a good chance of spending a decent amount of time on the map. Obviously, you want minis for your people and the miniers are a big part of, that. Like they're on the map all the time. So they, instead of just giving you this bloat of plastic that is gonna be in the box most of the time, they allowed you to get this, this version, the base game version, that just has what you need. And I think that's amazing because so often, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, Time of Legends Joan of Arc is, probably my first experience of really just overkill with the plastic. I got almost everything for that game. And then when it came in, I didn't know I, what in the world am I doing with all this? How am I even keeping it organized? Tainted Grail, no problems keeping it organized. They've got this, you know, uh, vacuum, uh, vacuum form plastic mold in here to keep all the minis in it. You have just the minis you need. I think more Kickstarters should look into this, this uh, way of doing things where you get a core set of minis that are the most important pieces. And then if you want the others, feel free, go buy those. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and then finally, number five, a deep, deep sense of exploration in this world. If you want a game that gives you so much to explore, this is the map, right? This is the map, and and the map sort of accurate, sort of not. And the game actually says, like, hey, by the way, this map was was drawn a really, really long time ago. It may not be completely accurate anymore. 
Uh, let's see what we got here. Yeah, so this stack of cards right here, these are all the different locations that you could possibly run into throughout the game. And the vast majority of these are locations that connect on the table as a map. And it mostly lines up with this. I mean, at the minimum, you can get uh, north, south, east, west directional off of that. And as you're exploring, there's so many cool, I mean, you start off in the Quinnacht farm hold and right away you can do chores for the townsfolk if you want to and gain one rep. And then of course, um, you can then, every single location has an entry in the journal that then provides even more, more exploration. And so as you go through this, you're finding, you know, all these different places that just so many things to do, so much exploration. All of the artwork fits together wonderfully. It, 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 sometimes when I, I got, um, I don't know, I probably had about 12 to 13 at the most out of any one time of these cards. And it just looks so cool having that laid out on the table like that. And this this map that I was working around, knowing there's all these different stories to explore in that map. So much fun. I loved it. So if if you are the type of person that loves exploring and loves, you know, when, when you see five or six different options here, that's going to be intriguing to you, then you are probably a type of person that might really, really enjoy this and, and needs to, to buy Tan and Grill. Uh, on top of that, the exploration is further accentuated by the fact that this is the type of game that doesn't, it's not giving you waypoints. Really, I mean, like it. Sometimes they'll say, "Okay, you specifically need to go to this place." Other times, they're really kind of just saying, "Hey, off in that direction somewhere is something you need to figure out." And here are a couple of clues as to what that is. Go, and it has a feeling of some, you know, nineteen nineties PC games, you know, where uh, you would basically just be told, "Hey, here's what you need to do. Figure it out." And that was it. Uh, and no real, you know, no waypoints on the map. No like, hey, follow this dotted line to go to where you need to go. None of that stuff. Just here you go. Good luck. And I found that really, really cool. Really fun to try to figure out. Even when it got frustrating, it was then that frustration gave way to a real sense of reward when I did figure it out. And I love that about this game. Now, on the flip side of loving that exploration, let's move into five reasons you might not want to buy Taina Grail, The Fall of Avalon. If you get overwhelmed by the options presented to you in an open world like this, I mean, and this really is an open world. There are very few places, if any, that are truly blocked off, you know, at the beginning of the game you probably can go just about anywhere for the most part. So if having that ability and the sometimes lack of clear direction other than hints and clues provided you by the narrative, if that's going to overwhelm you, if that's going to give you, you know, if, if you're going to feel a sense of anxiety that isn't like a good anxiety, not like a, Ooh, what are we going to do? But like, you're actually overwhelmed by it. And I know that there are people that are like that and there's nothing wrong with that. that Cause that is a very, it can be a, a tall order trying to figure out what in the world are they trying to tell me here? If you're the type of person who gets overwhelmed by, by that, I immediately would recommend you not buy Tanny Grill. Don't, don't play this game without a guide, at least without somebody in your group that enjoys it that is, is willing to take that particular part of the burden off of your shoulders. Also, if not being able to explore everything, you know, because of the time constraints that are put on you by the way that these chap the chapters in the game are, are built, there are time constraints kind of built into it. Um, if not being able to explore everything is going to be problematic for you, if you're not going to enjoy that, that's another reason not to to get the game because like I said and let me see let me see if I can find so like I said this right here I, this isn't no spoilers here you're just seeing tick marks on, on this that uh, on, on a page that you can see regardless see how many boxes are not ticked off that's how much stuff I didn't find while I was playing the narrative while, while I was playing through the narrative so if having all of that left unknown 
is going to bother you, you don't want to play this game. You don't want to buy this game, all right? Because just by the way that the story is going to unfold, you're not going to see everything. If you try to see everything, you're going to die. If you try to see everything, you're, you're going to get lost. You're, got, you're not going to make any progression in any meaningful amount of time anyway. It's, or I should say, the amount of time that this game is going to take, if you're trying to see everything, is going to expand exponentially. It's going to get a little ridiculous. So, if the massive open world with sometimes very little direction is going to cause a problem for you, or if not being able to see everything is going to cause a problem for you, I would strongly recommend staying away from Tainted Grail. As I've kind of mentioned already, and, and, and so my, uh, point number two here kind of feeds into what we've been talking about already. Many of the hints are very, very subtle. Many of the hints on where to go are subtle. There's one hint in particular that I feel was even poorly written. Uh, and it's, there's only, it was only one time in the whole game that I felt the narrative failed me where it was an important piece that I needed to understand. And because of the way it was written, um, basically, because of the way it was written, I ended up coming up here, exploring up here, trying to find the thing I needed, when really I needed to be over here finding the thing that I needed. And that doesn't look like a long distance. That is to get from somewhere up here to over here on the game tiles, that's probably seven or eight turns. Um, now, once you know, I went on the forums, tried to figure out what I missed, once I saw the intention of what was written, it is in fact written in such a way that that it makes sense that it should have been in the correct place. Like, like the correct place makes sense. But myself and others, probably about half the people in the forums misread it and read it in the way that I read it and it ended up looking up here instead of over here. Look, it went to the north instead of the east. So those type of hints that are not explicit, that is something that you're going to have to be willing to, to dive into and try to figure out what the intention is here. And if that's not something that you're okay with, if that's something that's going to frustrate you, stay away from Tainted Grail. Now, speaking of frustrating, my number three is the grind. And if you're, especially if you're not playing on story mode, which minimizes the grind, this game is a grind, especially when it comes to your resources down here. Food in particular, is, food in particular, sometimes feels disproportionately important. It is the single most important resource on here. Um, and while it's technically the maybe the easiest to find in terms of, oh yeah, there's the food, most of the time you have to kill it for it to be food. Most of the time you're hunting down card the green encounter cards, which are a lot of nature cards. You're hunting them down to find food. And... So because of that, you end up getting damaged. And so like it's this cycle of you need food so that you can rest as you get enough energy back to be able to do anything, but then you're spending energy to find food in the first place and it can start to feel like a site. Now, there are abilities that you can get by, you know, by building out your, your attributes and everything that can make you a more efficient gatherer of food. So that's cool. Uh, and one of one of the characters has a built-in ability that allows them to find food just by spending two energy. But two energy is a lot for just one food. So that's kind of like a, an emergency situation there. Uh, otherwise, you have wealth, which you're not really, like most of the time, you're not trying to... It's not important that you store up wealth. Now... Sometimes it will become critically important. Once or twice in a story, there's a uh, there was an option that I really wanted to get, and I needed a certain amount of wealth. So then you have to find a spot on the map to go get the wealth. Uh, reputation, same thing as wealth. Those two things are kind of both of them. Most of the time, you can get along without, but things can be easier if you have them. Experience, I don't experience. 
especially the beginning of the game, feels like it is few and far between getting experience points. I feel like that ramps up pretty pretty well with the difficulty. You know, as you get further in the game, you get more experience for doing more things. But it can still feel like you're really having to grind to get it. And to level up your character is not cheap. It, and and when as you start leveling up, the pairs, so uh, aggression and empathy are, are paired, right? So as you level up in aggression, empathy becomes more expensive and vice versa. And each of these are paired like that. So uh, in fact, let's see, I can tell you... Um, so two experience points is what you need to get new combat and diplomacy cards. So anytime you, you have the option to level up, you can spend two experience to get more combat and diplomacy cards into your deck. So that's not too bad. Uh, two experience points is how much it costs if your attribute pair is empty. So if there's nothing on either one of these, it'll cost you two experience points to put one in one of them. Then uh, after that, the second point in one of them is going to cost you four, then six for the third point, eight for the fourth point, and then every point after that is 10 experience points. 10 experience points is a lot. That is a lot in this game. So you can see how it ramps up pretty quickly. And then finally, magic. Magic, unless you're fighting purple encounters, magic is, is one of those that you feel like you just kind of have to get lucky to find it. Now, Maggot, his special ability is he spends two experience to gain magic. Um, but that's still kind of expensive, right? Like that's again a a stopgap. You you want to find ways to get magic, and, I, and again, everything I'm talking about, everything with the grind, whether it's the the resources down here or the attributes, um, every part of that you can find skills to make it a little bit easier. You can find items and or, or you know weapons companions, all this kind of stuff to to make to minimize the grind. But that grind is still there and it is a big part of the game and it, in the beginning of the game when you don't have any skills, you don't have any um items, you don't have any companions, the grind is a very real part of it that you're going to have to be okay with. And if that doesn't sound fun to you, then I would play Tanny Grail before you buy it. I don't think it's a deal breaker, but I think you definitely should play before you buy in that case because it is a major part of the game. All right, so number four, if you want to play with more than two people. So at the beginning, I said how I've played primarily solo, and then once I played with three people, yeah, there's a reason why I only played once with three people and why I didn't try harder to get two people into it. Or like to get another person into the game with me. Three people was the downtime, especially when combat started. If only one person was involved or two people were involved in combat, the downtime for the people not involved is pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Um, I strongly recommend playing this with playing a solo or with two people. I, I think, be, well, because when I play solo, I use two characters. And it seemed like I was going back and forth between, the, between those two characters pretty regularly, right? I, I don't think the downtime would be so horrendous. And plus, it, when it's two people, you're both kind of planning it out, talking it through. As soon as your turn's over, it's the other person. And so it doesn't feel like there's that downtime, I would imagine. Three people was bad. And I... Four people, I can't even imagine what it, how bad it would be playing with four people, the downtime. So if you want to play a game, if you want a campaign, a epic campaign and adventure with more than two people, this is not for, I, w- I won't even say play it. I would say don't even bother with Tainted Grail if you want to play with more than two people. It was that... That much of a problem. Now it was a, it was still a fun game when I played with three people because I was introducing it to two new people who were in turn about to buy it. So that was a lot of fun getting to teach them and getting to see them see the potential here and how much fun they were having. But it still was a slog, and I don't see how that I don't think that would improve because this wasn't a situation where they were just trying to learn the rules. They they caught on really quick, and it, it was just that the way the game is made, the downtime is is pretty bad. Finally, number five, 
Number five is kind of a collection of things. Just a, a few other things that might piss you off that you should be aware of before you get Tainted Grail. Um, I'd say probably a thing that even I, I don't, I, there's no redeeming quality to this for me. So die rolls in narrative. So there's some moments in the narrative where you're told, all right, roll a die and then this, this, or this happens. And one of those, some of those things basically mean that that narrative is over and you have to kind of go back. You lose basically in that particular encounter or it's this negative consequence that you have no control over because it is literally just down to a die roll. And any mitigation that you could have done, you didn't know about that mitigation before coming into the encounter. So essentially, you just had to be lucky in having the right stuff to mitigate the die roll ahead of time. That I really, that I don't like at all. And that's something that I can see a lot of people getting pissed off about. Um, I feel like in the, once you get into this narrative, if there anything that needs to be randomized should not also have the potential to cause you to lose that particular encounter. It's not really called an encounter, but you know what I'm saying. That, that particular story or script or whatever, you shouldn't lose what's happening right there because of a die roll or a coin flip. And for whatever reason, that's, that's the case. Now, there are some ways to mitigate. I believe there are some items you can get and stuff like that. But all that is still luck too, like, like ending up with the right items. The, the main issue I have is that going into that story, that narrative branch or whatever, you don't usually know, hey, I should have this with me or I should have this attribute or, or this or this to help mitigate what's about to happen. If you knew that ahead of time, I would be I'd I'd be less annoyed by that. But as it was, it was a big annoyance and I'll be honest, once or twice when I was deep into a chapter, when I was an hour and a half, 2 hours into a chapter and my guy is all torn up because we've been dealing with level 4 purple monsters or or whatever and I got to a narrative thing where I rolled the die and what was going to happen even though because of the situation I now found myself in was essentially going to amount to me losing the chapter and having to start over. I may have fudged a roll or two, like because it was it was that annoying for me. And I'm not the type to usually do that with with games. I, I like trying to stick to the rules. I like trying to win it the way you're supposed to. But mm, once or twice, it really bothered me, and so I kind of took matters into my own hands with that. Uh, let's see. Ah, yes. So the dials. Now the game comes with these plastic coin dials. I have the metal ones that I, I paid for the upgrade. Um, putting these dials into the men here, uh, the dials have numbers on them. All right. And don't worry. Uh, I know you can't see it from there because I can barely see it from here. And the numbers a have a pretty terrible font so like the number one also looks like an upside down v um the let's see the numbers five and six if you don't have good eyesight can look very similar and and so having to put the here on the map and use this dial to count down the turns until the here is going to go dark pretty annoying i've seen some people get dice and get dice and put them kind of in here and use that because it's easier. If you have any sort of vision issues whatsoever, this is not, this is going to be a non-starter for you. That's not going to work for you. The die, the, the, um, the dial, you're going to probably want to use dice instead. So that was something that I, I thought very cool idea. It looks cool. If they had done a better font and some more contrast, it could have worked cool, but as it is, it's a, a pretty big annoyance. Uh, I actually played the whole way through the game with it just because my eyesight's pretty good and, you know, I have these lights that I use for filming and I would always have them on whenever I was playing so that I could see the dial well. But if you have either eyesight that's not great or you have kind of normal lighting conditions in your house, these dials could prove to be a bit of a problem when reading them on the miniers. 
And oh, and also speaking of the dials, there is a uh, frequently through the game you're asked to flip a dial, and because you have you have a skull on one side and the grail on the other side, and usually the skull, if you flip the dial, you get the skull. Something bad happens, and if you flip the dial and get the uh, grail, something good happens. Uh, I mean, flipping the dial, whatever. It's it, it is what it is, but. I did that, so I did, I flipped it so many times and it had it shoot off somewhere or fall on the ground or whatever. I eventually just broke down and started using a, a six-sided die. One through three was a skull, four through six was the grail, and that's how I did it for the last half of the game, basically. So that's one other thing. Uh, and finally, if you're someone who is a complete stickler for rules, you're not going to, well, I wouldn't say you want to not get it, but you're going to want to really pay attention to the FAQ, read up on the forums, because the rule book definitely leaves some things to be desired, for sure. It's also not laid out particularly great. Um, it's laid out better than Etherfields. I mean, the Awaken Realms kind of has this issue with their rule books, I've noticed. It's laid out better than Etherfields, but it's still not fantastic, but... But it does have an index. People, if one thing that Awaken Realms does right is the index in their rule book is pretty exhaustive. It really covers almost everything. So while their rule book itself is not laid out in the most in, in the best, most clear order, use the index. It's great. Now that being said, the rule book still leaves out some things. Uh, that have been answered in the FAQ, but you are going to have to do a little searching. I have a instructional video for it, or a two-part instructional video that I think does a pretty good job of covering down on almost everything. There's probably some FAQ stuff that still isn't covered in the in the instructional video that um, you can get from the FAQ itself. But so those four things as just kind of some final little annoyances, uh, I think you should be aware of. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that after seeing this, you know whether or not Tainted Grail is a game that you should or shouldn't buy. Personally, I absolutely love Tainted Grail. You can see what I rated it right there. Uh, I have had a blast with it. I've got the three additional campaigns ready to go. I am going to eventually get to them. I've got other campaign games that I've got to get through. Etherfields is still set up on my table on down below the camera right there. I think I'm getting close. I think I'm like four or five missions away from the end of Etherfields, so we'll see about that. Very, very excited to get into more of this, but it does have some hiccups, some flaws, some um, things that you should definitely be aware of that I've covered here today in case it's not a game for you. But if it is a game for you, you are gonna have a blast with it. It is so much fun. The, like I said, the story by itself. I, there, was a, there was one moment in here that really felt like a Red Wedding moment for me, as far as like the sudden turn in, in the politics and everything of the world. It was, it was a pretty interesting thing. Anybody that's familiar with the Red Wedding, Game of Thrones, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Anyway, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give it a thumbs up. Click the bell if you've subscribed. Well, subscribe and then click the bell so you'll get notifications every time I have a new video coming out. Uh, I'm trying to knock out one of these reviews a month at least. Uh, most of my stuff is still going to be gameplays and how to plays, but reviews are something I'm slowly bringing back to the channel. They've been gone for a few years. So thank you again, and until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.